read some um, some paragraphs from Who Am I? Um, but I'll read. I'll start with um, the tenth paragraph because this is really dealing with the practice. Bhagavan says, even though the vasanas, that's our dispositions or desires to attend to things other than ourself, um, even though they come uh, from time immemorial, uh, oh, sorry, even though the Vishayavasana, which come from time immemorial, rise as thoughts in countless numbers like ocean waves, they'll all be destroyed when Swarupa Dhyana increases and increases. Swarupa Dhyana means meditation on oneself, in other words, just self-attentiveness. Without giving, even when, uh, uh, giving room even to a doubting thought, is it possible to dissolve so many vasanas and to be or remain only as self? It is necessary to cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness. Uh, um, it doesn't sound so strong in English when we say it's necessary to cling tenaciously to self-attentiveness, but in the, the way Bhagavan expresses that in Tamil, Swarupa dhyanate vidā pidiyai pidika vendum. Vidā pidiyai means unleavingly holding, um, unle- sorry, unleavingly holdingly holding self-attention. Uh, so, so that he puts in such a strong words in Tamil, but it's difficult to convey that exactly in English. So that's the crux of it. But one says, um, without leaving it, we should cling firmly to self-attentiveness. That's the crux of the whole thing. Um, and then he says, however great a sinner a person may be, if instead of lamenting and weeping, I am a sinner, how, can, how am I going to be saved? Uh, he completely rejects the thought that he is a sinner and is uh, steadfast in self-attentiveness, he will certainly be reformed or transformed. Or it's the word can be inter- the word Bhagavan uses so can be interpreted in many ways, but we can take it to mean we uh, go back to our original form, which is just uh, uh, pure self-conscious being. <coughs> and uh, um, the next paragraph is a continuation of the same idea. As, as long as the Shea Vasanas exist in the mind, so long uh, the investigation who am I is necessary. Um, as and when thoughts arise, then and there it is necessary to annihilate them all by investigation, that's by the child, by the self attentiveness, in the very place from which they arise. We all think that. Um, thoughts of an obstacle, we keep on being distracted by so many ideas about the world and about our little lives in this world and we think that's, what, that's a big obstacle to us but um, whatever thoughts come, they, we have to be there to experience them so without us there are no thoughts so the thoughts, just like the waves remind us of the presence of the ocean the thought should remind us of the presence of ourselves, the base of all the thoughts. So, uh, instead of being distracting, they should be reminding us uh, all these thoughts, all these perceptions, this whole world exists, or is, seems to exist, because I am. I am is the basis of it all. Um, that's what Bhagavan means by annihilating the thoughts by the chara in the very place from which they arise. They arise from us and uh, they seem to distract our attention away from ourselves. But if we, uh, if we cling firmly to the self-attentiveness, to the vichara, the, uh, the thoughts will be, they won't, as soon as they arise, they'll be annihilated. And then he says, uh, Remaining without attending to anything other than oneself is vairagya or nirasa, that's uh, desirelessness. And uh, uh, being uh, or remaining without leaving uh, what, uh, oneself is jnana. In truth, these two, desirelessness and jnana, are only one. Just as a pearl diver tying a stone to his waist and submerging, picks up a pearl which lies in the ocean, so each person, 
submerging um, and sinking you know, deep within themselves with their agya um, uh, can attain the pearl of self. So just like the pearl diver, he had to tie a stone around his waist to sink down, so also we have to tie this uh, desirelessness, this freedom from attachment to all the thoughts. The thoughts arise because we're so interested in them. So long as we're interested in them, they'll we'll continue thinking them, they'll continue arising. But, so we have to um, we have to refrain from, I mean, we have to cease desiring to think of all these thoughts and then they won't arise. And then we can, then only we can sink deep into, to attain the pearl of self. That's what we really are. If one, uh, and then the next sentence is a very beautiful sentence. If one clings, a very reassuring sentence. If one clings fast to uninterrupted Swarupa Smarana, Swarupa Smarana means self-remembrance, until one attains uh, self, Swarupa, that alone is sufficient. So, by the way, no, nothing else, no fancy sadhanas, no yoga or japa or dhyana, nothing is necessary. If we do this one simple thing, Swarupa uh, Smarana, the simple remembrance of I, simple remembrance of ourself, that is sufficient, nothing else is required. And then he says, so long as enemies are within the thought, they will continue to come out from it. If we continue destroying or cutting them down, or cutting down all of them, as and when they come, the thought will eventually come into our possession. So the, the thought there is what we really are, our, our own heart, our essential being. And so long as these desires are within us, the, the vasanas, they'll continue coming out. But the more we cling firmly to self-attentiveness, um, the more they'll get destroyed as and when they arise. And eventually, all our, that, that one by one we'll remove these, we'll, we'll remove the very force which is driving our mind outwards. And eventually we'll subside within. I don't know if anyone has any questions or whether I continue reading. <laughs> Can, can I just yeah. ask a question? Um, as I understand it, it's the I thought that is the, the problem. Um, when the I thought is transcended, mm. do thoughts still arise, or is it thoughts arise only when there is a, an I thought? Or, I don't want to be technical, I'm just... Uh, yes, okay, we, we may not be technical. Yes, that, that's the whole thing. It, there can be no... There has to be a, a, the I thought means the ego, the thinker, the subject. There can't be any thoughts without a thinker. So um, what Bhagavan means by the I thought is the, not what we really are, but what we seem to be. That identification with the body, the mind, with all these things, that is the, the, the thinking subject. And without this thinker, this subject, there can't be any thoughts, there can't be any objects. So, without this, this, um, this perceiving eye, we can't perceive this world. Without the experience, there can't be any experience. So that is, yes, if, you, if, we, if we can, uh, this I thought is the root of all other thoughts. So if we, if we can root this out, we can, that'll put an end to all thoughts. And the only way to root it out if what this I thought is a, a, what this I thought is is a wrong knowledge about what we are. We mistake ourselves to be this body, to be this mind, to be I am sitting, I am talking, I am thinking, I am doing so many things. All these are a wrong identification. And this wrong identification will last so long as we don't know so long as we seemingly don't know what we really are. As soon as we know what we really are, we can't know ourselves as we really are and know ourselves as what we are not. The two cannot go simultaneously. So self-knowledge destroys the ego. Because the ego is a false knowledge about what we are. False experience of what we are. So if, if we, that is the root. We root out that. 
that's all that, uh, Bhagavan says in the very first verse of Akshara Mumai. Oh Aaron, actually you root out the ego of those who meditate on you in the heart. There, Aaron actually is a, a personification of self. So if we, if we meditate on ourselves in the heart, that will root out this wrong knowledge that we have of ourselves. It is so simple. That's why it's difficult to come here and give, give a lecture because <laughs> it's all said in, a, it's said in one or two words. But I, I, it's great to ask questions because it continues dimming your thing. Because we all, we all forget this. We all understand this, but we forget it. So the question is, is not valid? Yeah. Yeah, the, Actually, the, yeah, the only important question is who am I? What am I? If we, can, if we can find the answer to that, which cannot be an answer in words, it can only be an experience, if we find the answer to that, there will be no other questions. That's why Bhagavan said, doubt the doubter. We can be, philosophers argue so many things about the nature of the world, whether everything is physical or everything is mental or this or that. So many ideas people have. Read any newspaper, people have so many views about so many things. There are as many opinions in this world as there are people. On every different subject, we all have a, our opinions. But all, all, these, uh, all these different views, they exist because there are I, there's an I who has these views. We can uh, deal with this I, everything else is solved. And can I just ask a question about the description of that ego as an I thought? Yes. Are you suggesting that uh, a thought can think? Can thoughts think? Then that's, that seems to be the import of that suggestion. Well, okay. What Bhagavan says is that that which is thinking, thinking is unreal. That which seems to be thinking is not what you really are, not what we really are. It is, it is a, an imposter, something that seems to be what we are. And, and everything that seems to be, but isn't... Everything other than what really is, is a thought, an idea. So thought doesn't mean sometimes people... But sometimes one says, the thought, who, who am I? Yeah, sorry, the, the thought I am is body. He sometimes describes the I thought, the thought I am is body. And some people say, oh, I, I know I'm not this body, but we don't know we're not this body. We all experience ourselves as this body. So what Bhagavan means when he says the thought, he doesn't mean just the, the verbalized thought. He means the, we have an experience. We experience ourselves as this body, very much tied down in this physical matter. That experience of I in a limited form, that limited I, Bhagavan says, is just an idea. And to that idea, that thought, all other thoughts arise. Without an I to think from, there can't be any thoughts. But this I that thinks from is itself, according to Bhagavan, just a thought. Yes, and so that we assume that that I is a brain or the mind. Or yeah, I mean, we have all sorts of ideas about yeah. it, but that's again thoughts, it's all ideas. Everything is ideas. Well, um, for the jnani, yes. Um, <clears throat> the number when the jnani is away, there is walking, there is eating, there is perceiving, there is thinking, but there is no thinker or perceiver. That's what you're saying. Is it? Who says that for the jnani there is there, there is thinking, there is, there is there is doing, there is all these things? It's in our view. Bhagavan says, we cannot understand the jnani. Because for the, Bhagavan says it very clearly, but for the jnani there is nothing other than self. He knows nothing other than self. He or she, I mean, the gender doesn't matter. Just a convention to say he. Um, because obviously jnani is beyond, it's not a body, it's not anything. Jnani is what we really are. If you want to, we, we see, Bhagavan, and we think, oh, he is a jnani. But Bhagavan says, this body is not a jnani. 
The only real jnani is in you. The I which sees this jnani, that is the real jnani. Yes, I think that, of course, that's the real self. Yes. It's just that sometimes um, there's a confusion that activity stops, but things go on. It's just that there's no one doing anything. Well, it, 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 but, 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 yes, but, but com the confusion is we think things go on after jnana. But that's because we see both of We think this body is a jnani, and this body is answering our questions, he's eating, he's doing all these activities. So there must be some type of a parallel. There must be difference and non-difference going hand in hand. But one says all that is false. For the jnani, there is only jnana, nothing but jnana. There is no multiplicity of any sort whatsoever. It is perfect advaita, non-duality. And yet, uh, I think that uh, <coughs> one and others say that, uh, but nevertheless, uh, when, they are, when the body is participating in the world, then I remember there is a, a, a um, there is a statement somewhere in Prabhupada that yes there is a better, yes but when the, the body is participating in the world you don't sort of simply think that everything is yourself yeah well, we we, I we mean, it, it's we, all there yeah it's but, Rama, but that doesn't mean there's but, no distinction but when say it's absurd to act as if to try and put a dwaita into action exactly. because a dwaita is a state in which there is no action. So trying to put a data, this is half-baked philosophy. When you try to, to, to apply it, to, um, when you try to apply, it, apply the absolute truth in an empirical situation, and that's why the distinction is made between paramatika sakya, the absolute truth, and vivaharika sakya, the, 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 truth, the seeming truth of this vivahara we're all caught up in. It's worldly activity. If we, if we destroy all thought, yes, make the mind clear. Yes, is it is it am I to understand the self just perpetuates itself, or there must be something to look for the self? We, when the, the only state in which all thoughts are, are destroyed. Is the, state, is, is the state in which the thinker himself is destroyed. So, so they, in that state, there's nothing, there's no one to look for anything. There is just pure self awareness, nothing but that. But so long as we are in the, uh, in, uh, until we attain that, so long as we are in the stage of abhyasa, or practice, um, we, we have to be looking for something. But what we're looking for is not anything other than ourselves. We are only try what we are, what we are seeking to attain is a clarity of self-awareness. We all, everyone knows I am. We know that we exist. We don't know what we are. So we know that I am, but we don't know what I am. So we, so long as we are in this state where we seem to experience all this multiplicity, we have to make effort to try and experience what we really are. So what we are saying, in essence, is we are using part of the mind to look for the self and then what would, what will happen or what, what has happened is that that seeking part disappears and only the self appears. Is that what we are saying? Theoretically? Yes, yes. Well, first thing, it's not a part of the mind. It's a, but when said the whole mind should be that our entire attention has to be focused on the source, that's on what we really are. <clears throat> Only when the entire attention is fixed on that, that clarity arises. When that clarity arises, everything else disappears. So it's a kind of intense focus <coughs> without expecting anything. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, nothing is going to happen, yeah. just everything is going to cease happening. Ah. Uh, well, can be fruitless to a certain extent. Yes, well... Or, too much of a pursuit. Yes, the, yes. Only, the only worthwhile endeavour yeah. is to know what we really are. Everything else we can leave till after that. But after that we'll find there's nothing else to worry about. <laughs> there's a kind of 
stop the world, I want to get off. Exactly, exactly. Bhagavan says when the atom bomb of jnana uh, uh, descends on this world, the whole entire world disappears because it's built on such a flimsy basis. <coughs> this entire universe with all these billions of galaxies and whatever, imagine all these scientists and others imagine. Whatever we imagine about the world, all our mythology, all our religion, all our science, everything, it's all built on the flimsy basis of this ego, which disappears every night when we go to sleep and pops up again in the morning. Why does it pop, how does it disappear and pop up again? Because when it disappears, it doesn't disappear in clarity. It, it disappears because of sheer exhaustion. So, so it, 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 it submerges in a state that seems to be a state of darkness. From the perspective of the waking mind, sleep seems to be a state of darkness. But Bhagavan said, actually, sleep is a state of full uh, knowledge, a perfect clarity, because there's no mind there to obstruct it. But it doesn't seem like that to us because we arise again the next morning, because we fell asleep out of exhaustion. <clears throat> we, we need to enter that state of sleep, not out of exhaustion, but out of a clarity of self-awareness. If we enter it once like that, we'll be asleep forever. But that sleep will be the sleep of jnana, which is the, state of, the true state of waking. The words, we can describe it in any way we like, it's just words. But, uh, it sounds a bit frightening, doesn't it? It, why does it sound frightening? Because we are so much attached to what we take ourselves to be now. We each one take ourselves to be this body, this person. We have a little life. We've, had, we've got so many memories of the past. We've got some aspirations for the future. Most of us still have a few years ahead of us. And um, we hope we have anyway. We don't know. <laughs> Who knows? The next moment could be the last moment. But uh, we believe this life. We believe that I am this person. I was born so many years ago. Some, hopefully, of many years ahead, I'm going to, not till many years ahead, I won't die. We, we believe in all this, and we're attached to all this. It's very important to us. Who can say their own little life is not important? I can pretend that Michael is not important to me, but actually Michael is the most important thing to me. Everything else, it just for the sake of Michael, I'm doing all these things. So uh, that, is <laughs> that is why it appears frightening. Because we don't want to let go. But it actually is so easy. If we are ready to let go for one moment, it's the have end of story. Have you done it, <laughs> if, if I say I've done it, there's still an eye to say I have done it. <laughs> but I can tell you from my perspective I haven't done it <laughs> if you okay. so could we say in a nutshell just pursue and don't worry about pitfalls just pursue the goal and don't worry about yes, it yes. because you are not really you go in without an expectation yes you just well, how nice it your mind. Yes. Sorry. But the, the obstacles, the pitfalls are a thought. Yeah. They're another idea. So we, we should do, who, who has fear of pitfalls? It's, whatever thought arises, whatever idea we have, should remind us that we are there to think it. And so we should turn our attention back. We should be, that's why Bhagavan said, Vida Pidi Pidi Kavendam. We've got to, Unceasingly, that is unletting me go, uh, clinging fast to that self attentiveness. If we do that alone, if we cling firmly to that Swarupa Smarana, that self remembrance, that alone is sufficient. But you don't use the word I. Try to avoid using the word I. No it? harm in using word I. Okay. We, we have so many words in our language. All those words denote things, don't yeah, they? Yeah. If I say book, a certain idea comes to our mind. If I say London, an idea comes to our mind. If I say train, an idea comes to our mind. Whatever word we mention brings a certain idea to our mind. When we say I, it reminds us of our own existence. So if that can, Bhagavan said, if you want to do any japa, do japa of I, 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 or I am, I am, I am. 
I went and said, if you want to do, uh, if you want uh, to do Japa, the holiest name of God, the original name of God, that is I. So no harm in the, in the word I. But don't just clean for the word. Find out what is the import of that word. Yes. And then it ends. Yes. And all the characters in the screen and all their questions end. And yes. Well, the dream. I mean, the dream is the best one because every it's night, great. as you say, yes. you come someone else. Yes. And have a whole set of questions. And so long as you're experiencing it, it it's seems real. Right. I don't have any real. thought of the root of the eye. Yes. Uh, it can never be answered to the question because you can You can never. It, it, it cannot be answered in words or by thoughts. The only answer to the question, who am I, is an experience, the experience of perfect clarity of self-awareness. And that, in that perfect clarity, everything else is, um, is dissolved. You, you mentioned the, the cinema, but one of the analogies Bhagavan gave, in old days in India, they used to, uh, they used to show uh, cinema in, a, um, in tents. So Bhagavan said, if while the film is being shown, if a big wind comes and, and blows away the tent, what will happen to the picture on the screen? It disappears. So also when the light of self-knowledge comes, the whole picture of this world will disappear. And the picture of this world depends upon the darkness. Without darkness, you can't project the picture on the screen. So also, we can't project this world without a darkness. That darkness is the darkness of self-ignorance, self-forgetfulness. The seeming lack of knowledge of what we really are. But it's all seeming. Bhagavan says, Jnana is not something you have to wait for in future. Jnana is here and now, just see it. down to how good we are at self-remembering, sort of keeping on self-remembering. Yes, how good we are means how skillful we are. Yes. That, the, the, our skill in that is proportionate to the strength of our vairagya, the strength yeah. of our freedom from desire to think anything else. Right. That is the skill we need. That's why Bhagavad Gita uses the analogy of the stone that the pearl diver ties to his waist. Yes. That, that stone is desirelessness, yeah. a lack of uh, any volition to attend to anything else, to experience anything other than I. It's almost impossible in practice, I mean, to, to, to forget the sort of essential questions and to stop self-remembering. What, so what, what is really impossible in practice <coughs> is, is to be ignorant of what we are. Right. But what's, what, it, when we say it, it's impossible, it, it's what seems to be impossible, what is actually impossible, what Bhagavan totally denies and says it never happened, ignorance has never happened. Mm -hmm. But so long as we uh, complain that we're in a state of ignorance, that we're suffering and that all this world is giving us so much trouble, Bhagavan doesn't admit the reality of that, but he says, see to whom it's happening. It, it, so long as we are in this state of ignorance, it will seem impossible. But we just have to try and do it. And when we, the more we practice, uh, uh, it, the, the, the only way of rooting out our desires is by experiencing I more and more clearly. Yeah. So it's only by the practice. It, uh, what seems impossible now will one day appear to be the easiest of all things. And what appears so easy now, we think it's effortless thinking. But that is actually a big, big effort. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just have a question. Um, I guess the main problem for most of us is the, what is that attention? And what is it? And I was just wanted to ask you in a way the easiest way to understand the explanation of this. Would it be that? Uh, 
when one is not attending to anything, when there is simply attention, when yeah. there is simply awareness without any particular thing, is sort of, and it's well, more spacious. And when, when we are aware of things, there is something that is aware of those things. So when we remove the thing awareness, the awareness of all things, what should remain is the awareness of that which is aware. There is a state called sleep or manolaya where we somehow fall between these two. That is, um, that is a type of protection that the mind has. When the mind is too tired, usually the mind is protected from self-knowledge, this dangerous jnana. It is protected from the danger of jnana by constantly thinking. But when it's too tired to continue thinking, it has a reserve protection, which is layer or sleep. So we have to remain poised between these two, between the the, the lack of awareness or seeming lack of awareness of sleep and the seeming distraction of thoughts in waking. We have to remain between these two in a state of balance, summer. That is, and the state in which the mind, D, is in a state of summer is called samadhi. That's all some, that's a real meaning of samadhi. I've been um, reading the Vivek Chudakamani recently yes. and um, one gets to the point where Bhagavan says all that is necessary is to realise that all is Brahman. Mm. And I wondered if you could just comment on that statement. Well, um, when we talk of Brahman, we are talking of it's a... Uh, it, uh, we have a, our only knowledge of Brahman now is it's an idea. We have a word, Brahman, and we have some vague idea what that word denotes. It's the absolute reality, it is the totality of all things, it is the essence of all things, it is the ground which supports the appearance of everything. These are <coughs> ideas. But so long as we talk about it, we refer to it as it. That is why the, the, um, the uh, Mahavakya says, Tatvamasi, it is you, it you are. It's bringing our attention away from the it, away from the idea of Brahman towards ourself. Because in order to experience Brahman, we must know ourself. So in a certain sense, you can say, Brahman is a bit of a distraction. The idea of Brahman, the idea of God or the absolute reality, it's a distraction. Because so long as we talk of Brahman or God or reality or whatever, we are objectifying it. That is why, that is the potency of the Mahavakyas. If each Mahavakya is drawing our attention away from the idea of Brahman towards I, which is the reality of Brahman. I am Brahman. Tattvamasi, you, you are, uh, that you are. Um, what is that? I am Atma uh, uh, Brahman and uh, Pragnanam Brahman. They're all pointing us back away from Brahman as an idea towards the reality of what Brahman really is, which is I. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, earlier, Shamani mentioned, uh, and you mentioned, Len. That seems to be my big problem. Falling asleep. Yes. You know, I sit there yes. and try and do uh, self attention. Yes. And uh, very soon I'm asleep. Yes. Well, I, one or other thing will. The, the mind has to protect itself. The mind. Nyan is a very, very dangerous thing. It's something we all fear, isn't it? You yourself would say. If, yeah. if this jnana, jnana comes, it's a big atom bomb. We're afraid of these little atom bombs like they dropped on Hiroshima. And we, one may, they, they may drop on all of us. We're worried about this. But the most that will do is destroy life on this little planet. But if, that, if jnana comes, that is, but one says, that is the atom bomb which will destroy this whole universe. So it's a very, very dangerous thing. So the mind has to protect itself. 
And it has only two ways of protecting itself. One is by thinking, by tending to something other than itself, something that it imagines as other than itself. That is one way of protecting itself. The other is, uh, is by sleep or layer. It has to protect itself in one way or other. So, so a real problem is this fear, isn't it? Really, yeah, well, fear yeah. is the opposite side of desire. If we had absolutely no desire for anything, there would be no fear. Because we desire what we don't have, and we fear to lose what we do have. They're just two sides of the same uh, paper, inseparable. So long as there's desire, there'll be fear. Fear is, it can potentially be a very useful, uh, a powerful tool. But there, one of two things can happen. Normally, if, if a fear of death comes to any of us, what happens to our mind? We, our mind rushes outwards to all the things that we fear to lose. We fear to lose our, our, um, our health, our wealth, everything. We, we fear all these things. All, all, the, all that we hold, all that we value in our life, we fear to lose. So when the fear of death comes, we begin to think of all these things. When the fear of death came to Bhagavan, the opposite happened. Because Bhagavan, those, there may have been seeming attachments there as a child, but actually those attachments were just a thin, thin veil. But what he, when the fear of death came to him, what he really feared to lose was his own existence. Not even the existence of the body. He wasn't perturbed by the, the thought of that the body is going to die. When his body dies, am I going to die? So whereas the normal reaction of almost all of us, when the fear of death comes, we think about other things, Bhagavan thought only about I. He faced up to that fear. Who is it who has this fear? For whom is this death that I'm fearing? It is for I. So his attention, though when he described his death experience, because he, in order to describe it in words, he, it sounds like a thought process he went through. It wasn't, but he clarified there was no thought process. That fear came and his immediate response was to turn within to find out what is this I. Without any, without any uh, process of thinking. It was just an immediate response and so the jnana came. So the, uh, Bhagavan's experience shows us that fear can be a very powerful, motivating thing. Just like uh, fear can be a great distraction, uh, desire can be a great distraction. Both can also be, both are also necessary as a means. Either fear can drive us in, or love can drive us in. What we call desire is just a, a distorted form of love. So it is, it, it is that um, it is one or other of these two uh, powerful uh, motivators is necessary in order for us to finally give up all our attachments and turn within. Can one not love the self and the world, or be the self and still love the world? Um, it seems it's it, okay. No, okay. Okay. Um, to all people who were with Bhagavan, Bhagavan appeared to be the most loving person. And we feel, when we're in the presence of Bhagavan, everyone feels Bhagavan is loving us. Which is true, Bhagavan does love us. But he doesn't love us as a person. He loves, all he loves is himself. And because he experiences only himself, he experiences himself in all of us, so he loves all of us. So it will appear that the jnani is loving the world. But actually, in his experience, there is no world, there is only self. So in loving the self, which is the reality of all that appears in this world, he is loving everything. So in that sense, but actually, in experientially, we have to make a choice. Do we want this beautiful world, or do we want uh, 
to know what is the reality behind this beautiful world. We can't have both. We can't, you, you, you can't simultaneously see the rope as it is and see it as a snake. Either you see it as a snake or you see it as a rope. But if we really love this world, if we really find this world so beautiful, then shouldn't that motivate us to find out what is the reality behind it? Because everything in the world, all this beauty is fleeting. The beautiful flower is beautiful one day, next day is wilted. So every beauty, everything of desire we see in this world, everything of value in this world is fleeting. So we should seek what is it behind all these things, but give them value. That is the reality. That is what we have to seek. Otherwise we'll be disappointed. The world is guaranteed to disappoint us. We have to get rid of all our things, but that doesn't, just giving away our material possessions is not going to achieve us very much. That's why Bhagavan never, Bhagavan was neither for nor against external renunciation. If Bhagavan said these things are according to destiny, some people are destined to get married and live a family life, some people are destined to be sannyasis, it doesn't really matter. Neither condition is more or less favourable for jnana. What we have to renounce is not any material things. We have to renounce the one who has desire for all these material the things. Desire. Yeah. No, not even, even, we cannot renounce the desire without renouncing the one who has the desire. So long as there is a mind, there will be desire. So we have to root out the mind. Root out the eye that has this desire. In Buddhism, so much is said about how the, the, the obstacle is desire. But Bhagavan says, true, but who has the desire? That one who has the desire, that is the, the, the root of, of the obstacle. That is what we have to do. The mind, yes. <coughs> Ourself as an individual. Yes. Yes. You have one single light that splits up into a rainbow of colours. Yes. And we are in this multi multiplicity where we are seeing all these seven colours and are failing to see that one point or that one source yes. of the yes. divine essence. So effectively the mind is like prism. Yes. So so because we are on this side, everything for us is these seven colours. So until yes. we get rid of that prism. Yes. So we've got to go back through the prism to, to the source, yes. So as long as we are here, we can't see there. And as long as you are there, you everything can't, is one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly, exactly. All that we are seeing here is, is ourself. But so long as we are seeing all these, ourself as all these things, we are ignorant of what we really are. Because self is not multiplicity, self is oneness. So the mind is that prism. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. I suppose what constitutes that prism is one's latencies, one's vasanas. Yes, that, yes, that's what yes, actually yes. prevents one yes. seeing the pure light. That sort of yes, distorts it and makes it. Yes, but, but those vasanas are themselves, they're the beginning of, uh, of uh, splitting up of the colours. Yeah, yeah. We have to go through the vasanas to. Who has the vasana? Right, right. Michael, could I revert to your answer to Barry's very interesting question about um, falling asleep in meditation? I, yes. I, I have exactly the same problem. Yes. <laughs> I guess quite a few of us have. Yes. Um, as you say, it's, it's a matter of maintaining the poise between thinking, the mind thinking and sleeping. Yes. Um, Stopping it from sort of falling into either of those refuges. Yes. Keep keeping it concentrated. Yes. Now, one, 
I sometimes manage to achieve that in meditation. But the question is how to how to continue that and how how to some keep in that state of you've managed state. to achieve it, have you? Well, I I haven't yet. <laughs> for, 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 for a second or two, probably for a second. Yeah, or two. It I seems know. it seems but all this is relative. But, but the, the moments of seeming thoughtlessness that we have in uh, when we're trying to practice yeah. is only a relative thoughtlessness. It's not absolute lack of uh, absence of thoughts no. because there's still that that root thought. I I am still meditating. I am still practicing yes. self attention. So it, we do we do experience relative states of freedom from thoughts, relative states of clarity. But it's still relative. What we need is the absolute clarity, the absolute freedom of thought. Yeah. We need that just for one moment, and everything is uh, everything. All our problems are solved. So, so that one moment is the atom bomb. And the yeah, moment. that's the atom bomb. Yeah. So, um, so, the only way to achieve that is to go on and on practicing. But the thoughts will continue obstructing us. The sleep will continue obstructing us. We just have to carry on in spite of that. Yeah. Yes, we just have to keep on, yeah, keep, yeah. Keep, keep at it. Yeah. Whatever we, else. We, we, we can't be sleeping all the time. We will wake up sooner or later. <laughs> Sometimes when, Bhagavan, when people complain to Bhagavan about sleep coming, he said, okay, if you're sleepy, sleep. <laughs> so long as you're sleeping, there's no problem. When you wake up, you can start again. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Didn't you say that um, if you if you if you pra you're practicing self inquiry as you go to sleep, yes. that process carries on. Yeah, well, well it's, it's very beneficial because at the moment the mind is subsiding, if we're able to try and hold on to that light, and that will help us. He also said, at the moment you wake up, try to catch that light because there is. In the, there is a transitional state between waking and sleep, or between dream and sleep. Either going into sleep or coming out of sleep, there's a transitional state. That transitional state is so subtle, most of us miss it completely. It's just like Bhagavan also said, between each two thoughts, there is a gap. Just like when... Um, uh, uh, a, a similar picture is projected on the screen. Between each frame, there is a gap, but we don't see that gap because uh, because it's going at a faster speed than our eye can grasp. So we have the illusion of a of a moving image. Um, so trying to catch that gap between thoughts or that gap between waking and uh, and sleep, these are all things we can try and achieve, but. These are all ways of describing it, because actually, what, however we describe it, what we're trying to catch is the I. What is it that is thinking these thoughts? What is it that is waking or sleeping? If we aim for that I, that's the most practical clue, most valuable clue. But otherwise, we can describe it in so many ways. I mean, and it's also it's a useful thing when you're when falling asleep. Try and, I mean, Bowen said, try and practice whenever your mind is free from other activities, other pressing activities. But the moment of, of, uh, of falling asleep is a very pressure moment. And Bowen also said to some people, don't be in a rush to get up in the morning. When you wake up, the mind is still relatively calm. Before the, all the thoughts about all the things you have to do during the day, and all the things that happened yesterday, all the things that are going to happen tomorrow, before all these thoughts rush in, take the, try to hold on to that at that moment. So Bhagavan gave many clues, but the essence of all the clues, what is a, an essential ingredient in every clue he gave, is clinging to I, holding on to the I. Even if you notice the gap between two thoughts, even then, the seer is there. The seer yes. is there. Yes. So long as the seer is there, there's no... So, we, I, actually, the, um, we never really experience the gap between two thoughts, because 
it appears to us that we we have a our experience appears to be as a um, it doesn't seem to us that our experience is many many discrete thoughts all yeah uh, happening in quick succession that gives us this, this appearance of a continuous experience. But according to Bhagavan, this our whole experience is made up of a series of thoughts rising and subsiding very quickly. And with every thought, the I rises along with it. And as soon as the thought subsides, the I also subsides. So actually in the gap between two thoughts, there is no seer, there is only self. Because self is, self is not a seer in the sense that there's nothing for it to see. The only thing it sees is itself. There must be somebody who observed that there's no thought. That is, some of these things can't be, uh, can't, we can't conceptualize it. But just try to experience it. If you try to experience it, for one moment you experience that gap between two thoughts, you will realize that there never were any thoughts. There is only that gap, the eternal gap. Like the gap. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the very dangerous gap. <laughs> In a way, that seems to imply it's just a slightly different practice, we're just looking for that an opportunity to sensitively looking for that well, uh, point between the two uh, thoughts. Well, that isn't quite self-inquiry, is it? It's it is self-inquiry, <laughs> because it, that, that's why I said, that's why I, I, I caution, though Bhagavan has given many clues, they're all clues for self-attention. So when he asks you to find the gap between two thoughts, yeah. we can't look out, because looking out is all thoughts. The only place we can find that gap is of the source, ourself. So we have to look to ourselves to find that gap. So, like Bowen sometimes said, try to experience the present moment. So long as you're experiencing any thought, and a thought rises in time. So it's, it's part of that flow from past to future. But between, between what it actually is the present moment, the present moment is a, is a, um, infinitesimally thin interface between what is past what is future. If you try to find out what actually is the present, there can be no thoughts there. Because the thoughts require the flow of time to occur in. So if you can and find that memory. precise present moment. But all these, whatever he said, they're all clues for one thing, namely self-attention. It's, it's interesting when, I mean, it, uh, when our mind gets um, is easily, our mind is easily fascinated by this world. It distracts us away from uh, self-attention. So all these clues Bhagavan has given us, we can experiment with these things. It's just another way of trying to keep ourselves, our attention fixed on that eye. That is the one essential thing. Most of these clues by one game, it was in particular context in answer to particular questions. But all we really, one essential thing we have to understand is all our problems are caused by, lack, by ignorance of what we are. They can all be solved only by attending to I. Yes, so if one holds on to that, onto that knowledge, it seems to be enough. That's all. That's all. That, that, that sentence I read, if you cling uh, uh, unceasingly to self-remembrance, Swarupa Smarana, remembrance of I, that alone is sufficient. Nothing else is required. I mean, we do conceptualize these things. There are, um, there's the nature of our mind to conceptualize these things. And a certain conceptual understanding is necessary to direct our attention in the right direction. Yeah, but you can't but ultimately, call this a problem. Ultimately, this... we can have any number of concepts about self. Yeah. But, but self is not conceptual. <coughs> so no concept can capture it. R Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said, the fact that we are never satisfied with anything finite, and we're always trying to experience something beyond that, that dissatisfaction 
is a, is itself a sign that we are infinite. <laughs> Rambling is the nature of a mind. <laughs> but so long as we ramble around this topic, it's good. <laughs> Rather than rambling anywhere else. <laughs> I missed that. <laughs> I guess the thing is we keep trying at a certain point it happens by chance, in a way. You know, like there's nothing we can actually really do. Yes, well, what, it's, what, what, it's like you just keep going, keep going, yeah. and at a certain point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a steady whittling away of the, removing the, the layers of the onion until you come to nothing. If I may. If one keeps one at a focus of one attention on the pulse or the pulse in oneself, the beat, then no thought would arise. The pulse itself is a thought. Everything is a thought. Even the eye that is, is keeping its attention on that is, according to Bhagavan, a thought. Is the breath a thought? Yes. The whole body is a thought. Well, between the silence between two breaths is not a thought. No. Um, Suri Nagama, who recorded letters from Sri Ramanashan, once when she was in Bhagavan's hall, some learned pundits that were there and they were talking to Bhagavan about, uh, about nadis and chakras and all these things. And the talk was going on for a long time, and she was feeling more and more depressed because she thought she doesn't know about all these things. And how is she ever going to learn about all these complicated things about nadis and uh, chakras and all these things? So after those, um, those learned people had left and Bhagavan had become silent again, she said, uh, Bhagavan, can you teach me? I don't understand anything about all these things you were talking about. Can you teach me about all these things, about these nadis and chakras? And Bhagavan said, why would you want to think about all these? Why would you want to know about all these things? They're just ideas. And she said, what, Bhagavan, they're just ideas? Bhagavan said, when the body itself is just an idea, <laughs> what is all these things? Following for my question, which I think is a So I now say that we should have a book expounding the fact that all is thought and what we call awareness or attention is also thought. Um, awareness is what makes thought possible. <coughs> the, um, the, when awareness feels the existence of thoughts. It is that awareness is not the pure original awareness, but it is the form of awareness that Bhagavan calls ego or the thought I. Awareness in its pure form, as pure I am, is not a thought. Mm -hmm. But when awareness identifies itself with objects, with the body, and with actions and so on, I am sitting, I am talking, I am walking, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that their awareness has become a thought. Yes, but I mean, yeah. Or appears as a thought. I am referring to an experience I had many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, which lasted for three days. Yes, well, when, when people told Bhagavan of such experiences, mm -hmm. he would always say, mm -hmm. Who was it who was having that experience? Experiences come and go. You say it lasted three days. That means Open it had a beginning and it had an end. Yes. But the one who experienced that is still here and now. So know that one, the I that experienced that. That is what that is Bhagavan's recommend Bhagavan's advice to us. Yes, but that is that is, that is in a way attempting to dismiss any experience as, as, as being, I'm trying to get, get an appropriate term, but it, it is a, a, look, there's a sacred moment in a month's life. Sacredness is a value we give to something. Mm -hmm. But according to Bhagavan, what is really sacred is I. Everything else, the, the, the sacredness we see in anything else is a sacredness we have projected on it. 
say about the label I, somebody is holding on to the word I now and, and saying I've got a special understanding of I and uh, you don't you, you, you don't have it. So basically anything Well the I that says that is an ego. Be, That's not the I we're talking about. It is the essence of it's the I miss in that ego which I'm talking about. Is so long as any I says, I know it, you don't, or I've got something special, that is, it is, there's an appropriation there. That appropriation is the ego. The nature of the ego is to appropriate what, what is not I and take it to be I. The awareness that is aware of anything other than itself, that is aware of otherness, is the mind. That is what Bhagavan said, that awareness is a thought. But that, what, the, the, that is a, um, the mind, by the one says, is a combination of chit and jada. The, there's the, the awareness and there's the body. These two, when they're bound together as one identification, I am this body, I am a person called Michael, etc. Um, that is, the awareness that feels that is a thought. But the source from which that awareness arises, the chit part of that chit jada granti, the I am in I am the body, that is pure awareness. <coughs> that is the, that is not a thought. That is just pure being.